Okay, so uh, the next study that we're going to look at is Kohlberg's study, um, and this is looking at um, morality. Um, so it's looking at moral development, um, and it's really trying to develop a systematic um, set of stages of how morals develop in children. So, uh, first, I think the key thing to ask is what do we mean by morals and moral development? So morality relates to how we interact with others um, and moral development refers to the way that children begin to cognitively construct a system of beliefs about how we should interact with others. Um, so here's an example of um, something that you would call a moral dilemma. So have a read through of this very kind of famous moral dilemma known as Heinz's Dilemma. Um, so have a read through it and uh, answer the questions at the side. So you might just want to pause the video here while you read through it. So really this is a moral dilemma that can be used um, to establish somebody's moral reasoning. Um, so it will their answers to these questions will enable you to establish what they think is kind of the right and the wrong way to interact with people but it will also um you know tell you you know perhaps why they've come to those conclusions um so looking at the question should he have stolen the drug would it change anything if he didn't love his wife so it's kind of how you feel about people um a reason why rules could be broken um, is there relevance to you a reason why rules could be broken? Uh, things like that. So, there are already, before Kohlberg did his research, some existing theories of moral development. Uh, so, for example, Freud is somebody we are quite familiar with. Now, Freud uh, suggested that your personality is made up of the three parts, id, ego and superego. So Freud suggested that when your um, super ego develops, it is due to the internalisation of your parents' um, social and moral values. So in the Oedipus and the Electra Complex, when you um, identify with that same sex parent, you internalise those characteristics and part of those characteristics are their system of morals and that's the development of your superego. Um, so there's two different parts to your superego, there's the conscience, um, so that's the part that makes you feel kind of guilty and feel bad for your moral thoughts and deeds and the ego ideal, the part that will make you feel good and make you feel full of pride and satisfaction for good thoughts and deeds um, and then Freud thought that that's really where your morals come from so Freud suggested that moral development proceeds when the individual's selfish desires um, and that's your kind of your unconscious sexual desires and things like that are replaced by um, values of parents so you may just want to pause the video here and write some of that down Uh, the next, oh, too far, the next uh, kind of theory that um, was put in place for moral development is Skinner's behaviourist theory. So again, we should be fairly familiar with Skinner. So Skinner suggested that you um, learn behaviours that are desirable and undesirable through conditioning uh, namely operant conditioning so that you learn what is moral through external forces such as reinforcement so in other words if you are positively reinforced for saying a certain certain thing or behaving in a certain way then you're going to have an awareness that that is desirable and therefore you perhaps might think what you've done is moral um as opposed to um if you are punished for something, then you're going to think that it's not desirable as a behaviour and therefore you might think that that's immoral. So again, jot some of that down. And then the last theory of moral development is Piaget. So you are a little bit less familiar with Piaget, um, but Piaget believed that it was important to study um, 
both how morality appears in the child and also the factors that contribute to the emergence of um, central moral concepts such as welfare, justice and rights. Um, so Piaget often interviewed children um, and he argued that very young children have quite a rigid um, view of morals and that relates to things like obedience and authority so something is seen as moral if um, if kind of like an authority figure might tell you to do it if your authority figure will be pleased by it um, or um, something like that but then actually with age so kind of from about 11 years upwards the children will become more autonomous because of social interactions and their understanding of morality becomes a little bit more fluid so that morality is is changeable depending upon circumstance So finally, then Kohlberg's ideas. So Kohlberg was um, inspired by Piaget's efforts to try and apply a structural approach to moral development. So Piaget essentially came up with um, different um, stages of child development rather than linking it to uh, personality traits as some researchers did. So Hartthorne and May um, did try to link this to uh, personality traits like things like honesty, altruism, self-control, things like that um, but the, there wasn't kind of any significant personality um, findings really here so he therefore decided to expand on Piaget's ideas uh, but he thought that moral development was a bit more gradual than Piaget so um, he didn't really kind of favour um, Freud's ideas or Skinner's ideas, but he did latch on to Piaget's. So he decided that there is a systematic three level, six stage sequence of development um, of, of morality. And that can across, occur across the lifespan and they are invariant in structure. So by invariant, it means it does not vary. So, in other words, he's set out these um, three levels and the six stages within these three levels and you will progress through each of those stages in the same order as the next child. So they're invariant in structure because you will progress through them in that process. But they are variant in speed. Um, so he doesn't necessarily say that every child will progress through them at the same ages. Now, um, Kohlberg argued that uh, development proceeds from a selfish desire to avoid punishment, so kind of personal concerns. That's why you might think something is uh, moral or immoral at a, a young age, because you want to avoid punishment. And then you start to move to um, societal functions, so uh, how it's going to affect the group. And then finally, a concern for the consistent application of universal ethical principles but as it says there not all access all levels so just as though he said that they're not varying in structure but they will vary in terms of the speed at which you progress through them he did also acknowledge that actually not every child will reach the end of these stages not every person will develop all the way to stage six but generally they suggested these kind of structures and forms of moral thought um, and we're gonna we're gonna look at what they are. So uh, this is um, Kohlberg's idea of moral development. Okay, it's quite a big table. Um, I'll just talk you through each one. You may want to pause after each kind of level. So the first level is the pre-conventional. Now he said this was usually ages kind of 4 to 10, but remember these are varying in speed, just not structure. So um, that's level one. And within level one, you've got stages one and two. So stage one is punishment and obedience orientation. So that is um, the idea that rules are kept to avoid punishment so the child might be well behaved and responsive 
to cultural norms but may misbehave if that authority is missing so the child is kind of thinking in this stage how can i avoid getting punished and that is why they would behave in a moral way because they want to avoid getting punished stage two is the instrumental relativist orientation so um right behavior is that which ultimately brings rewards to oneself so a child behaves in a self-centered way and it does what brings benefits to them so that what's in it for me so the more kind of reward seeking here so they're likely to do something that's moral so help somebody out if they know that they're going to get praised for it or get given a treat for it later on next you have the conventional level that's level two and in this you've got stages three and four so stage three is the good boy good girl orientation now in this stage children believe that good behavior is what pleases others so they're conforming to the idea of goodness so the child is looking for approval from others and will begin to consider the intention of the act and by the intention we mean you know did you mean to do well um so they're, they're thinking in this stage really is what do people say is right and wrong so i can do things which people say are right um and i'll do things which would make people say that i am a good girl or good boy now the next stage stage four is law and order orientation so this is doing one's duty or being laws is important so the child now sees right behavior as a duty to show respect and maintain social order so laws are set in stone so in other words those laws kind of get internalized in some sense the laws that we set out into in society to keep society working as it is are now kind of internalized as this is how i should behave this is my code of conduct and in order to be respectful i will maintain that code of conduct and it will maintain social order and if something occurs that breaks that law breaks that rule then actually then that's immoral so the child's thinking in this stage is really i must respect others by doing what is right and make sure everyone else does too level three is the post-conventional level and in this you have stages five and six so stage five is social contract orientation so this is the idea that what is right is what is democratically agreed upon and so the child now does what they uh, deem to be right based on laws but also personal values and opinions so it's the idea that laws are changeable so we've we've got those laws we understand those laws but actually if that law um challenges one of my personal values and opinions then actually that law isn't right that law isn't moral um so in this stage the child's thinking is more like understanding that there is a difference between laws and morality and that laws can be questioned and stage six uh universal principles orientation so this is where moral action is taken based upon self-chosen principles so the child now bases judgment on universal human rights um on justice equality reciprocity respect so they have an understanding of all the laws um you know that we have previously mentioned but it's not necessarily the laws in this one that actually determine their behavior it's now what the child kind of has developed as this is this is what i believe in um so for example something a child might think here is that all individuals have value so just make sure that you've got all of these in your notes now in this study kohlberg aimed to find evidence to support his theory of moral development so piaget was his inspiration really there is a touch of behaviorism in there in the sense that we are talking up here about you know like punishment and what's in it for me and then that kind of them influencing future behavior so there's a touch of behaviorism in there but piaget is really his core um starting point So this is what you would refer to as a longitudinal study so this 
followed the development of the same group of boys for 12 years. So it would present them with hypothetical moral dilemmas. So there was quite a few and some of them are uh, quite similar to the Heinz's dilemma that you looked at right at the start. Um, so the aim was to show how as young adolescents develop into young manhood, they move through these distinct levels and stages of moral development proposed by Kohlberg on the previous slide. So Kohlberg also studied moral development in other cultures by using these hypothetical moral dilemmas. So this study does have a bit of a uh, cross-cultural element. So, um, the sample was 75 American boys and these were aged 10 to 16 at the start of the study. Now, like I say, we followed these for um, 12 years and we followed them at three year intervals. So, for example, if you were 10 when we started the study, we would interview again at 13 and then again at 16, uh, again at 19 and then again at, uh, at 22. Um, so this would therefore then be able to show us how that child was developing over time because we'd be comparing their, their results at age 10 against their results at age 13, for example. Now, moral development was also studied in some boys of other cultures. So this includes Great Britain, so that being made up of Scotland, England and Wales. Um, it includes some boys from Canada, boys from Taiwan, boys from Mexico um, and boys from Turkey. Okay. And while he was um, studying boys in Taiwan, I think there was also some study of boys in Malaysia as well, which is not on the list, but he does mention um, studying boys from a Malaysian village. So there's a slightly different uh, procedure, similar but different procedure for the American boys and the boys from other cultures. So the American boys were presented with hypothetical moral dilemmas in the form of short stories to solve. So these stories were to determine each participant's stage of moral reasoning for each of 25 moral concepts or aspects. So he was testing 25 different kind of moral ideas and concepts. Um, now, I've put two there and a typo, uh, which I've just noticed. Fantastic. But uh, there's two there and these are the only two that you are going to concentrate on for your exam. So these aspects included motive given for rule obedience. So in other words, motivation to follow rules. And uh, the value of human life. So these are the two that you need to focus on out of those 25. Um, so they might um, ask questions such as um, age 10, they may ask things like, is it better to save the life of one important person or a lot of important people, unimportant people? And age 13, they may ask questions uh, upwards like, should the doctor mercy kill a fatally ill woman requesting death because of her pain? Um, and they also, as I say, used um, scenarios similar to Heinz's dilemma as well. Taiwanese boys uh, aged 10 to 13 were asked about a story involving theft of food. So this is where it becomes similar to Heinz's dilemma. Um, so, for example, a man's wife is starving to death, but the store owner won't give the man any food unless he can pay, which he cannot. So should he break in and steal food and why? So, as I say, young boys in Great Britain, Canada, Mexico and Turkey were all tested in a similar way to these Taiwanese boys. So this slide really looks at, um, in each stage, what is the child's motive to obey the rules? So the first one, the child's obeying rules to avoid punishment. So in this first stage, they're more likely to be asked the question about, is it better to save the life of one important person than a lot of unimportant people? Um, and um, generally, it's 
determined by um, that likelihood of them being punished, what they choose to do. Um, in all the next few stages, remember, you're more likely to be asked the should the doctor mercy kill a fatally ill woman um, dilemma. Now, in the next stage, stage two, it appears that children are going to conform to uh, rules to uh, obtain rewards or have favours returned, things like that. Stage three, uh, they want to avoid disapproval and being disliked by others, so they're more likely to obey the rules because they don't want someone to think less of them. Stage four, uh, they want to conform to um, avoid kind of feeling things like guilt. Remember, we said this was about like maintaining social order and things like that this stage and showing respect. So they may feel guilty for not showing respect. Stage five, uh, they may want to conform to maintain the respect of uh, impartial spectators, judging in terms of community welfare. Um, so actually, this time it's about what's important for um for a community rather than what is important for them or people necessarily important to them. And uh, last one, stage six, conform to avoid self-condemnation. Um, so they're conforming so that they're not um, placing that upon themselves. Uh, you also need to know what in each stage they believe to be the value of human life. Um, so each of these um, scenarios, saving the life of one person or lots of one important person or lots of unimportant people and the mercy killing are both um, related to a life being kind of lost or not lost. Um, so these scenarios and the responses to these also tell us what children believe to be important in deciding whether someone lives or dies, what the value of human life is. Um, so in that first one, the value um, of a human life is confused with the value of physical objects and is based on social status or physical attributes of the possessor so it might be about like the volume of property he possesses um so a child might say that um all um those people who have um you know there are lots of unimportant people together they probably are worth more than the one important person perhaps um or if that one important person has kind of like a um a, a good job and they earn a lot of money maybe they might see them as more important something like that uh, stage two the value of human life uh, is seen as instrumental to the satisfaction of the needs of its possessor or of other people um so in this um, second stage, their value of moral life. Um, so when they're being asked about the, the um, mercy killing of the woman, they may say that the value of her life um, might rest on the wife herself, but actually it's more important to think about her value to her husband. So he can't replace her um, as easily as he might be able to say replace a pet. Um, he might have to then pay for her funeral. Um, who's he going to have the companionship um it might um affect his life negatively in some way if she was gone and so because of that you might choose to actually try and keep her alive she's quite valuable because he's dependent upon her um in stage three the value of human life is based on the empathy and affection of family members and others towards its possessor so when being asked about the um, mercy killing of the woman, um, then this might be based on the husband's uh, human empathy and love for someone in his family, that he doesn't want someone that he loves so much to kind of go through the pain of death. Um, and um, 
it doesn't account for any kind of universal human value. So perhaps she would hold um, no value if she didn't have a husband to love her um, because then actually there's no kind of affection of family members and no value of um, them to possessors or anything like that. In stage four, um, they say that life is conceived as sacred in terms of its place in a categorical moral or religious order of rights and duties. Um, so that means that the value of human life is universal. So in other words, it's true for all humans, but it is still dependent on something else. So it's dependent upon things like respect for God and God's authority. It's not an autonomous human value. So not everybody is equal in this, um, but there is kind of some um, religious, moral reason to keep somebody alive. Stage five, uh, the value of life is defined in terms of equal and universal human rights. Um, so in relation to community welfare as well. Um, so for example, the value of life is relative in the sense of um, what are the consequences to the community of that person not surviving, basically. And lastly, you've got stage six. So in stage six, the value of human life is based upon the fact that there is a belief in the sacredness of human life as representing a universal human value of respect for the individual. Um, so you're seeing this value of human life as absolute. Um, you have um, come to some conclusion, essentially, about the value of human life um, as being universal rather than dependent upon some kind of social or divine um, authority. So in this you might say that a human life has some kind of inherent value whether or not that life is valued by anybody else um, and that the worth of a human being is central where the principles of justice and love are normative for all human relationships. So, um, like Kohlberg said, in terms of reaching kind of like stage six or even stage five, some people may not reach those two. But make sure you've got all those down in your notebooks. Uh, there were some other findings as well. Um, so there were results that showed that about 50% of each of the uh, six stages that existed, a participant's thinking was at a single stage. So regardless of the dilemma involved, the participants um, showed progress through the stages with increased age. So as they got older, they did tend to progress through them, but more than 50% percent of kind of each of their thinking each of their responses was either at stage one or stage two or stage three so there wasn't kind of 25 percent stage one 25 percent stage two 25 percent stage three etc so in other words by the majority they fit into one stage or the other not all participants reach stage six uh, participants progressed through the stages one at a time and always in the same order. So this comes back to the fact that they are invariant stages in terms of order. And once a participant has reached a particular stage, they either stopped or they continued to move upwards. So in other words, you may continue to move up, upwards to the stage six. Um, or, for example, you may get to stage four and stop. There were some findings from other cultures as well. Um, so Taiwanese boys aged 10 to 13 tended to give quite classic stage two responses. So responses related to self-interest orientation. Whereas middle class urban boys um, aged 10 in the US, Taiwan and Mexico um, followed the order um, at 
the kind of the fastest speed, if you will, uh, and then lower class urban boys were the next quickest, and then village boys were the slowest of all. So actually, perhaps there is some influence of kind of maybe where you grow up in terms of how fast you can progress through those stages. Uh, in the US, by age 16, stage six was rarely used. Um, so not many people had made it to that stage at that age. At age 13, the good boy, um, good girl construct, um, obviously we only looked at boys, um, was not used. Mexico and Taiwan showed the same results, except that development was a little bit slower. So that's in comparison to the US. At the age of 16, uh, stage five thinking was much more salient in the US than either Mexico or Taiwan. So that means that at the age of 16, uh, there were more American boys who appeared to fit into stage five than Mexico and Taiwan. But there was enough boys from Mexico and Taiwan that did fit into that stage to show that actually it's not a purely American stage, um, but there's just far fewer boys who seem to fit into it at that age. There was also results um, of um, some villages, um, so one in uh, Yakutan, uh, one in Turkey, um, these showed that moral thought increased steadily from ages 10 to 16, um, though it had not achieved a clear ascendancy over pre conventional thought. So in other words, there was a development of moral thinking, um, but actually um, a lot of the time it didn't go beyond that self-interest orientation. Um, so for example, in Atayal, which was a M Malaysian um, village, um, I've also noticed the spelling error in Malaysian. Uh, Malaysia should be spelt M-A-L-A-Y-S-I-A. -A -A. Uh, it's a slight spelling error there, apologies. Um, but in the Malaysian village, uh, the decision um, was made in relation to um, whether... Um, remember, they were presented with the should he steal food in order to save his wife idea and um, the decision was made based upon the fact that no one would cook for the husband so it's the what's in it for them thinking um but in taiwan it was the cost of the funeral so actually there is a little bit of influence of culture there in the fact that the taiwanese boys were more to say he should steal food in order to feed his wife and save her because then he'll have to pay for a funeral if she dies and it's a cost to him whereas in this kind of malaysian village it was kind of a cultural effect of, well, then he's not going to have anyone to cook for him. Um, and it may be that funerals, in the sense that lots of cultures know a funeral as kind of a celebration of life, which can be costly, um, is not necessarily a concept of their culture either. Uh, there was also no effect of religion. So they looked at Catholics, Protestants, uh, Jews, Muslims, atheists and they also looked at buddhists and they found that actually none of those uh, factors were necessarily influential in um the moral choices made so it appeared in these kind of three divergent cultures here um the middle class children appear to be kind of more progressive in moral development than, than children you might consider to be lower class when looking at kind of village boys being the slowest. I have also just corrected that spelling of Malaysian there for you. So uh, make sure you get all that information in your notes. So um, the conclusions of this research are um, really, that moral development occurs in the same sequence regardless of where a child grows up. The nature of this sequence is not significantly affected by social, cultural or religious background. And that's because, remember, we said it's invariant. So all of them are progressing through these stages. Um, moral, develop, moral thoughts develop like all other kinds of thought. 
um, in which each successive stage um, is a better cognitive organisation than the one before. So your thinking is, is better, superior in um, stage two than stage one, stage three than stage two and so on.